Helen Norton is an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Law. Previously, Ms. Norton served as a political appointee in the Civil Rights Division of the White House from 1998 until January of 2001, first as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, and then later as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, where her duties included supervision of the employment litigation section. Welcome, Professor Norton. We're happy to have you with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Helen Norton, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Law. My testimony here draws not only from my work teaching and writing about employment discrimination as a law professor, but also from my experience as a deputy assistant attorney general in the Department of Justice, where my duties included supervising the Civil Rights Division's enforcement of Title VII. Current federal law prohibits job discrimination, job discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, national origin, age, and disability. These statutes provide many valuable safeguards for American workers, but federal law currently fails to protect gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender workers from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. In fact, the case law is replete with decisions where federal judges has characterized, have characterized egregious acts of discrimination targeted at gay, lesbian, or transgender workers as morally reprehensible, yet utterly beyond the law's reach. You've heard some powerful examples already today. In the interest of time, I'll focus on just one for now, but I refer you to my written testimony for further examples. Michael Vickers, a private police officer employed by a Kentucky Medical Center, alleged that his coworkers subjected him to harassment on a daily basis for nearly a year after they learned that he had befriended a gay colleague. According to Mr. Vickers, his coworkers repeatedly directed sexual slurs and other derogatory remarks at him. They placed irritants and other chemicals in his food and in his personal property. And they engaged in physical misconduct that included a coworker who handcuffed Mr. Vickers, Mr. Vickers and then simulated sex with him, all because of Mr. Vickers' perceived sexual orientation. Just last year, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals dismissed his claim, concluding, while the harassment alleged by Vickers reflects conduct that is socially unacceptable and repugnant to workplace standards of proper treatment and civility, Vickers' claim does not fit within the prohibitions of the law. To be sure, some states have tried to fill these significant gaps in federal law by enacting important anti-discrimination protections. Eleven states and the District of Columbia currently prohibit job discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation as well as gender identity. And I note that the, gender, the definition of gender identity in H.R. 2015 tracks the definition that a number of these state laws use and have enforced for a number of years. Another eight states bar job discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. But employers in the majority of states remain legally free to fire, refuse to hire, harass, or otherwise discriminate against individuals because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. As a result, current law, both federal and state, leaves unremedied a wide range of injuries and injustices. H.R. 2015 would fill these gaps by clearly articulating, for the first time, a national commitment to equal employment opportunity, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. H.R. 2015 does this while accommodating concerns that it would interfere with religious institutions' ability to make employment decisions consistent with their religious beliefs. In fact, H.R. 25 not only incorporates Title VII's existing approach to issues involving religious institutions, it goes considerably further in accommodating such concerns. First, the bill completely exempts from its reach those religious institutions primarily engaged in worship or the spreading of belief. This includes churches, mosques, synagogues, and other houses of worship, as well as parochial schools and religious missions. Second, the bill further exempts an entire class of positions at other religious institutions, those jobs involving spiritual teaching or ministerial governance, such as chaplains or teachers of canon law, at religious institutions that are not primarily engaged in worship or the spreading of belief. And these might include religiously affiliated hospitals, social service organizations, and religious universities. 
Third and finally, the bill makes clear that those religious institutions that are not primarily engaged in worship or the spreading of belief may still require that employees, even in non-ministerial positions, conform to the institution's significant religious tenets, including tenets prohibiting same-sex sexual activity. For example, if a religiously affiliated hospital chooses to require that its doctors and nurses conform to its declared religious tenet against same-sex sexual conduct, H.R. 2015 does not bar that hospital from firing or refusing to hire doctors or nurses who engage in such relationships. H.R. 2015 accommodates other concerns as well, and in the interest of time, I'll reserve my discussion of them for any questions that you might have. And thank you again for the chance to join you today.